Hi, my name is Paul Harlan. I am course director for music history here at Full Sail University, and I am hosting the panel here with uh, the famous Robert Margaleff. And, uh, and I'm going to give you a quick little introduction here. He started out as a filmmaker with uh, Andy Warhol's factory, and uh, he made Chow Manhattan, a very famous avant-garde uh, art film. Um, this is his much later period. In the recent times, he's been involved with post-production until very recently. Um, he, in California, he has a um, Mikasa Studios. Now, way back in the 70s, he, had, uh, he started Tonto Synthesizer with Malcolm Cecil, um, and of course, famously worked with Stevie Wonder, amongst many other artists. Um, Let's take a look at, uh, there's a great picture of the three of them uh, in the early 70s, making the seminal albums. Let's take a look at a couple of those albums. Oh, there they are in 1974, collecting how many Grammy Awards? One, uh, three, two nominations, one Grammy. One Grammy, okay. Yeah. And here's um, Tonto's three albums they put out in the early 70s. The first album they put together, um, it's an interesting, interesting story how uh, Stevie Wonder decided to leave the Motown recording at the Motown uh, sessions uh, in the Motown studios and decided to move to New York and, and pick up with these guys with Tonto's album in his hand that, that um, really s sets the tone for what he did in the early 70s, all this classic stuff. Look at these songs that he created here, um, some classic pieces of music here. And of course, Intervisions, um, Grammy Award album of the year and best engineered album by Robert Margolef. Um, and look at the singles from this album. This is the reason, this album is the reason that, uh, that he is here today because it was sitting on, this album, this vinyl has been sitting on my desk in my office. And, uh, and this is, it prompted many conversations. Well, I know that guy. David says, I know that guy, so let's get him here. And we got him here. And, uh, and then of course he produced Devo's album with their number, um, what, top 14 pop single, Whip It. And uh, that's, 1980, and there we go. And take it away, Robert, please. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. Absolutely. Um, thank you. It's been uh, an interesting 40 year career so far, still going, still making films and still making music happily. And uh, once you get the bug, it never leaves you. You know, it's. Uh, I started out as a filmmaker, just a little bit of background, so you get a little bit more sort of balanced view of my life and uh, my life in music and film. And the interesting thing I do want to note at the front is I say music and film, because now music and film are now once again merging together, making my last project working with David Nielsen. Um, we... Um, see that we're making music and film simultaneously. Everyone has a, has a GoPro camera. Everyone's making their own 4K movies and 2K movies and uh, combining their skills of music making and filmmaking and combining the experience. And I begin to see that more and more. Um, I started out as a filmmaker upon my return from serving in the military as a combat photographer stationed in Germany. 1967, just before the Vietnam War had sort of settled in. I had settled in in the East Village across the street from the Fillmore East and was active in the underground off off Broadway theater season. When I went many of the, uh, where I met many of the refugees from Andy Warhol's factory. Uh, from those relationships, I ended up making a film called Chow Manhattan. In its day, it was uh, also a, uh, of groundbreaking film. It was a verite movie, very much like the documentary style of my combat photography and made it possible by the new lightweight cameras. We didn't have to use, it was lighter than a Mitchell camera. Mitchell camera took three people to gather it around and to move it around and it had to be in a blimp and a dolly and it was not very portable and very expensive to use. We got our Flex 35 cameras. They were considered portable and I put that in quotes. And now I look back at my career and I'm using a GoPro. It weighs like six ounces and it does much better photography than my Aries ever did. Uh, when I was preparing the soundtrack for that film, Chow Manhattan, 
uh, I discovered at the Electric Circus a thing called the Moog Synthesizer. And I fell in with a very wacky component, composer named Gino Pesercchio. And uh, I realized that this is the way I had to make a soundtrack for my movie. Uh, it was because that technology actually existed that I was able to apply it. And because I loved the synthesizer and what it could do, I actually directed, it actually directed the rest of the course of my life and my career. After that project, I left filmmaking behind and was consumed by my new passion, making sound and music utilizing the synthesizer. There were no manuals or textbooks or courses for this like you folks have today, mm -hmm. But I learned on my own and became a synthesis, eventually both making music and recording it. At Media Sound in 1971, which was founded by the creators of the Woodstock Music Festival, I became the studio synthesis in Resident Madman. They made TV commercials there and I created electronic music and sound for the commercials. The night's maintenance man there was Malcolm and we made TV commercials during the day and Malcolm and I fixed the studio at night because the, all the analog equipment started breaking the minute you turned it on. Malcolm was an excellent jazz musician. We became friends, and in time, we became collaborators and partners. Malcolm taught me how to become a recording engineer, and I taught him how to become a synthesist. And together, we created Tonto's expanding headband, Tonto, the original neo-timbral orchestra. Uh, the band still, we still haven't seen what that instrument could do today because we designed that instrument to be played, one instrument to be played by three or four people at the same time. So the programming and the music was actually totally interactive. One person's program would change how the keyboard reacted for the other player. For example, we would have a master tuning bus. So if Malcolm was playing a bass line, the entire instrument would transpose off of that one bus. So he played the bass line, and who's playing C major, all the other keyboards would play in C major as long as I only touched the white notes. If he played in B flat, the entire keyboard of the instrument transposed immediately to B flat. So playing on the white notes, you could never make a mistake. It was really <laughs> rather cool. Um, but it also uh, governed how the music was made. What did it sound like? Where was it coming from? People thought synthesizers were uh, things that imitated the sounds of live instruments. Well, we have samplers that do that now, but in my day, if you wanted a great sample of a piano, you took the piano, put a microphone in it, and you made your samples, so to speak. Um, but uh, we worked there at night in the studio uh, trying to figure out what the heck we were doing, if what we were doing was even music. Uh, in many ways, um, you know, an instrument played by several people at the same time, to me, it's still an idea whose time has not come. Eventually, we made a synthesizer album called Zero Time for Herbie Mann's label, Embryo Records, and uh, it, me and Malcolm played the instruments simultaneously. Incidentally, the synthesizer is now in um, Calgary, Canada, as of about six months ago, after 50 years of being played. And it has been totally restored, and it's at the uh, National Museum, uh, Keyboard Museum in Calgary, Canada. And it's being completely restored and will be made available to folks like you to go up and play and make music on, which makes me a very happy guy. Well, what's the significance of the, the, of the history of this? It's about technology makes innovation and creativity possible. If art is to be art, it needs an element of originality, new technology, can inspire new ideas. My introduction to the brand, to brand new tech, to the brand new technology of the synthesizer, while I was making a movie, that event determined my career would be from that moment on, including the hundreds of records and soundtracks I would be a part of. Because the next event in the story is when Stevie Wonder heard about Tonto through an article in Rolling Stone magazine. He came to the studio one evening to meet Malcolm and me and never left. He wanted what we had. We would work with him for the next five years. By the way, Stevie coincidentally came in the nick of time because by then I needed to be rescued from my day job, which was making Crazy Daisy toilet paper commercials in Studio A at Media Sound. And I really, it was making me crazy. It really was. Uh, a guy would sit there, you know, with a cigar in the back of the control room and say, hey, kid, 
you know, I had hair down on my elbows and a joint sticking out of my mouth. And <laughs> I didn't know about, you know, gray advertising. He said, hey, kid, could you make that thing sound a little bit more like a tablecloth? You know, I knew at that point my days, my days were numbered. <clears throat> and uh, strangely enough, at that juncture, um, through a, a, bit, a tragedy, strangely enough, but also fate, um, Malcolm and I decided that, and Steve decided that we had to move. Couldn't work at media during the day. It was guys with the pencil protectors and the, you know, very official looking uh, engineers and sessions with the union and uh, people coming and going, string dates and stuff. I couldn't keep the synthesizer patched up. In those days, there's no memory. The, and automation is what I still call Armstrong automation because you did everything by hand. Mm. Uh, so it became disturbing and time-consuming. A new studio had just opened downtown in the village uh, called Electric Lady Studios. It was Jimmy's first uh, private studio. It was the first studio built by an artist for his own use. Uh, the tragedy was that he wasn't really around very long to use it. Um, that turned into a blessing for us because I could go down there with Malcolm and Steve and I was literally putting my foot in a shoe that was already made. And uh, we stepped into Electric Lady and my world changed forever. That studio today, still playing, still making records down there. Records, as they say in New York. Hmm. And um, we decided to apply the synthesizer to rhythm and blues. Uh, we became a part of the very creative music community. We worked day and night. There was no such thing as morning, noon, and night. We were on Stevie time, being unsighted. He didn't really have a comp, you know, sort of a feeling of, well, it's 11 in the morning or it's 5 in the afternoon. But generally, we worked at night. It started around 4.30, 5 in the afternoon and worked through into the evening. I was able to set that room up. It was so personal and human. Uh, we could set it up and we could leave our instruments up. And um, just a quick back stroke for a second. When I was a kid in high school, I had the privilege of working with an unsighted person, uh, and I taught that person how to ski with a bell on my ski pole. But I um, used that knowledge to work with Steve to uh, be able to make sure that he could move around the studio on his own without having to be guided all the time, including use of the kitchen, the men's room, and so forth, so that he could feel at home in the studio. And I had the instrument set up in a circle in the control room and in the studio so that he could uh, move from one instrument to the next because he played everything. And um, Can you relate the story about how, he play, how you taught him to play the drums? It's an interesting story. Well, he, uh, we would find out where he wanted to put put the sticks and we'd put the drums in the place where he was used to having having the things so he could it was not really a normal kind of setup but Steve once you had the spatial relationship uh, down he would play everything I mean um, and uh, he, so his drum set didn't look normal you're saying it was uh, you know the drums were like sort of on a little bit moved around so that he could accommodate the uh, things but we were there in a very, very collaborative space. Uh, the studio is an instrument, basically. It is to this day. That's why we'll always have to have recording studios. How we store the information is not all that important, whether you store it digitally or analogly. It's not really an issue. What really is the issue is that music is the tribal ritual of our culture. It's us dancing around the fire banging on locks in our way. I mean. We've become more and more tribal. We return to that to seek our own individuality. I mean, just even look at what's been going on with tattooing in the last six or seven, maybe 10 years. It has become really a part of our culture. It was a part of the African culture for, for thousands of years. It's not that it's new, but it's giving people a chance of feeling of belonging to something. Strangely enough, Full Sail, I was here 24 years ago, standing in front of Full Sail's first building, once again designed by John Storick, who was the designer of Electric Lady. And um, 
So his history is long and wide, too. And uh, to this day, I now represent John's company, WSDG, in Los Angeles and build recording studios based on that very early, uh, uh, you can see. Somewhere in here. Yeah. Yeah. Based even on that, my studio in Los Angeles, which I, after a 16-year run, closed uh, last year because I have other dreams now, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, but John has gone on to build literally thousands of studios, and all based out of that first studio. That was his first design, was Electric Lady, which was really inspired by Jimmy. And it became a, the idea of the home studio came from that root, and f has followed me my entire career. When we moved west, because Steve wanted to, uh, wanted to move to California because Motown had moved from Detroit to uh, Los Angeles. What year was that? That was uh, 1973. So for which album that was? For? Uh, we were working on talking about, well, we worked on a whole bunch of albums at the same time. We never really worked on an album. Oh, we're going to make an album, you know. That was never the case. What we did is we created a library of songs. Mm -hmm. The stuff just poured out of Steve after he left Motown and came to New York. He had a lot of stuff on his mind. He had music on his mind. And that's why our first album. How many songs do you think you worked together mind. with him on? Oh, I don't know. Maybe 150 songs. Yeah, I, I think I read somewhere 240, but I don't know if that yeah, was. Yeah, it was a, a lot of songs. I used to keep a little completed. school notebook with all the songs in and what. Oh, Steve, we, we're doing backgrounds today. You want to do some backgrounds on living just enough for the city or let's work on superstition or let's do this one or that one? We never worked in order. We worked on stuff till we got it far enough along that we could relate to it as a song, and sometimes we pull songs together based on uh, what we thought would be good for an album. And then we would pick the ones that we wanted and finish those. But it was always an ongoing creative process. It wasn't, let's do an album now and then, you know, strut around and do an album. It was always, uh, uh, always sort of a selective process of pulling stuff out of the library. Did you know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but did you know when you were working with Stevie that there was what the relationship was going to be, what, who was the producer and who was no, the No, no, no. There's none that of that kind of stuff. When we first started, it was just the three of us in the studio, mm -hmm. Steve, Malcolm, and myself. And uh, at the end of the relationship, five years later, the place was packed with people, mm -hmm. hangers on and people smoking cigarettes, which made me completely insane. And uh, we, weren't, uh, we weren't in the same place with Steve, physically or emotionally. When you're a producer, you do things, you know, and try to remain innovative because that's what the producer really needs to do. First job of the producer is to get the artist to perform to his limits of his potential every time and to free him of any kind of thing that would hold him back. Uh, we moved out here. We moved to a place called Crystal Studios and got promptly crowded out of that by uh, Joni Mitchell and all of the folkies. To James Taylor and people like that were using the studio. You moved Tonto with you? Yes, we moved Tonto nice. with us nice. up here in a U-Haul truck. Mm. Uh, John built the cases. John Storick built the cases for Tonto, as a matter of fact. So he, too, sort of touched Stevie's world with that instrument, which really enabled us to, um, to be able to play the instrument live, uh, which we like to do. And... Um, uh, the instrument was not a polyphonic instrument. A polyphonic instrument would be something like a Hammond B3 or a Rhodes, where this, you push one note down, all the notes have the same sound. With a synthesizer, there's only one event or sound at a time, and that sound could have multiple layers or events in it. So we had uh, four to six voices, but each voice had to be played on its own keyboard. So when we were playing keyboards, Malcolm, Steve, and myself, we all had two keyboards each, so we were able to get like six voices simultaneously, which we used to create some of the very interesting timbres that you hear on some of those instruments because no two sounds were alike. It's not six oboes, you know, somebody doing this, or strings with the VZ parts of 10 and 12 parts because everyone sort of uses the keyboard interface with the string sound, which is not really the way a violin is not played like that. A violin is played like this. Mm -hmm. So you have a different 
sort of interface to the instrument, which really sort of governs its character. And Speaking of character, will you talk about the different oscillators that you put into Tonto and the companies that you used? Yeah, we used everybody's oscillators, including our own, but uh, we had Moog, of course. Bob used to come to the studio and sit on the floor, and we used to try to f figure out why the things weren't staying in tune, and we'd make modifications and stuff. We had Moog. We had Serge, who was a sort of a custom builder, kind of wacky guy, interesting guy. Mm -hmm. We had this guy, Arno, who was building, tried to build us a polyphonic keyboard. There were a lot of questions about how to adjust the leading tone in the chord so that we could do things with separate sounds. Uh, of course, we had ARP 2600s. We had David Friend from ARP who helped really do stuff. But the real trick was every synthesizer manufacturer's synthesizer spoke their own language. Mm -hmm. And what Moog, what we really had to do with Tonto was to figure out a master busing system and a master power system whereby we could get all the different components to speak to one another. Uh, that's one volt per octave versus one, Yeah, well, other some of them systems. were others had different, uh, different parameters for resonance and tuning and filtering and so forth. So it became a very sort of complex, uh, complex issue. And the bottom line also was that everything was temperature sensitive. Uh, I can remember playing, bringing the synthesizer to do the midnight special, and we had worked all day to get the whole thing all tuned up and all the patch cords in and everything. And uh, the minute everything was great, but the minute they turned on the lights to tape the show, the thing went completely bananas. So um, it was nightmarish. But Malcolm always wanted to go out on the road. Me, I wanted to stay in the studio. So. Um, um, what happened was we left Crystal backing up just a little bit, and we went over. There's this very wacky guy who was sort of living in the same world as uh, John Storick. His name was Gary Kelgren, and he and Chris Stone built a little tiny studio that exists to this day called the Record Plant. And uh, we built a studio at the Record Plant. Gary invited us to his house, just a very quick story, to uh, say, listen, bring Stevie to the Record Plant. We'll build a studio exactly the way you want to have it. And uh, we'll do whatever it takes to have Steve come to the studio. It'll be yours 24 hours a day. We, of course, felt like big shots. We were buying studio time by the year, <laughs> which was a kind of a very unique thing. First of all, being independent engineers, most engineers were, were employees of the studio, not employees of the artists. So it was a very different world. So we went up to Gary's house, which was on uh, Camino Palmero on Hollywood, was like this big old haunted mansion, former Canadian embassy. Once again, the Canadians <laughs> are in my world. And uh, uh, we got in the living room, in the dining room over the table, and Gary brought out the cavassier and poured the glasses, and we shook hands. And we all stood up and clicked our glasses. When we clinked the glasses, there was an earthquake. Ooh. And all the bricks were falling off the walls in the kitchen, and pots and pans were rattling. And uh, I looked out the back door through the dining room, through the kitchen, and I see this little tidal wave tsunami coming toward me from the swimming pool. And uh, that's really how we started making hit records. I guess God came down and touched us all on the forehead in a very strange way. Um, so, of course, the first thing that happened, hello, John Storick. He came out and we built Studio B at the record plant, of which that is the back wall. And we lived there for four years, uh, night and day, uh, day and night, week, no holidays, all Stevie time. Mm. Um, it was also the first room that I started experimenting with quad recording. Quad had becoming, just basically started to become a format, CBS, uh, Columbia Bell Labs, had developed some technology called CS, I believe it was called. Um, and we started experimenting with that. As a matter of fact, one of the first, uh, Tom Hidley came in, we put in big Hidley monitors, four of them, in that room at ear level. And uh, ear level monitoring is, today, a lot of people take that for granted. But remember that that's not the way it always was. Why do you go into a recording studio and you see the speakers on the on near the ceiling? Two reasons. One, in the film world, you want to get the sound over the audience's head. But the most important reason, there was a control room window in the front of the room, and you had to get the speakers over the window so you could look into the studio. So we started building a room out there. Tom 
did his monitors. We called him up for anechoic testing on the roof of the studio at night. And we built the first Hidley monitors with the big wooden lips. And we had that room. And in that room, I, Malcolm and I mixed the very first version of Superstition in Quad. And it was fantastic. Mm. It uh, just made your hair stand up with the horns coming up at the back and you occupying the same space as the music. And that never left me. Um, uh, where do sounds come from? How do our brains ever figure out where a sound is coming from? I mean, you take it for granted, you use your eyeballs to say, oh, I'm right here, I'm standing in front of you. But if I walk to the back of the room right now and started talking to you from the back of the room and you were looking forward, how does your brain know where that sound is coming from? That was always a kind of a thing for me because then the motion picture world, we started to, uh, we started to, I started to really understand that people wanted to mix with a view towards having people suspend their belief in reality. And um, I became very fascinated with that. Unfortunately, quad records didn't really make a big noise because we couldn't figure out really how to get the quad sound into the vinyl. It just, we were never really able to get that last little inch uh, to make that happen. But the, uh, uh, we were always poking along at the edge of, edge of technological change. Uh, collaboration, change, driven by creativity and an unconsciousness about the future. We didn't really think about what tomorrow would bring. Um, like I like to say now, you know, you can't change the past either. It's already in stone. And really, we don't know what the future is going to bring. We know certain things are going to happen, especially in audio and video right now. Some very interesting things on the horizon, but actually we don't know totally what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen to you tomorrow, or to me tomorrow. But we do know we have today, and that's why they call it the present, because it is a present. I like to say that, and um, I, uh, I believe in that. And um, I mean, yesterday, uh, my friend Bob Casali was alive. He was the Bob one in Devo, passed away yesterday. Okay, so he, ne he never knew what would happen, but, you know, he, he was there and now he's gone. So we have to understand that uh, life is full of change and as young students in your world, the best thing to do is, yes, you can look back, but the really important thing is to look ahead and to stay innovative because that's where the opportunities lie. Uh, if there wasn't the synthesizer and there wasn't Bob Moog, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. That synthesizer changed my world. But the reason I was able to get into it is because it was there for me to get into. So that was the first movie I made with uh, uh, portable equipment, our, our version of the GoPro, basically. It only took two people to carry the camera around instead of three. And then, um, uh, and you know, multi-channel audio, and all the things that came along faster and faster. Uh, it took us 60 years to get from, you know, a 78 to a 33. It only took us 10 years to get from a 33 to a 45, from that to tape, to uh, digital recording. You're looking at what I call um, uh, really the convergence of all the technologies are moving into a thing we call singularity where my cell phone has more power than the computer that took us the space shot to the moon. We live by our computers. Everything is on our computers. So with all that change, what do you find is the most interesting and promising for the, for the future as far as technology and affecting our lives every day? Well, it's going to continue to affect our lives um, more and more and faster and faster. As we can see, I mean, how many people here uh, remember carbon paper? Oh, not too many. All right. I, you know, that was a very advanced technology, the mimeograph machine, right? As a kid, I remember the mimeograph machine. But, you know, now it's a PDF. It's uh, the technology, we assume the technologies around us. And part of the important thing to understand about that uh, uh, is that 
it takes a while for the community for the equipment to catch up to the art but hmm. the important thing is we in the 80s we became a sort of addicted to the uh, thing I like to call the drum machine the, it's not a machine because there's no moving parts that's the opening comment on the drum machine for me <laughs> but uh, it turned our music very militant as I was discussing at dinner last night everything went to the foot and, well, uh, you know who set the trend, but after Kraftwerk, you worked with Devo. You didn't work with Kraftwerk, but Kraftwerk set that trend originally there. But right. then Devo, you worked with Devo and made Whip It, right. which was there again, metronomic, but very it was mel- Very time. militant music. So can you talk about that experience? That must have been a yeah, really um, interesting experience. Yeah, uh, Devo, you know, it's a very interesting record uh, in that it really, you know, I don't even know why Mark came to me in the original thing, but I remember them. I was sitting in the front office of the record plant, which had sliding glass doors overlooking a parking lot, and these two Volkswagen bugs came barreling into the parking lot with the blacked out windows. And out of these two cars came uh, Devo. Uh, They were dressed in black jumpsuits with hip boots, rubber hip boots, uh, the funny hats, and uh, and, uh, the hats had uh, hose coming from the hat and running up their nose. <laughs> okay. Of course, the record plant was a very, uh, what do you call it, nom de plume or whatever. Uh, nothing really was supposed to phase them at the front desk because people were coming in that place who really belonged in the zoo parade for the most part. And uh, they arrived, but they, these people actually brought the place to a stop. Um, uh, they were on, the, on their own revolution and very interestingly um, um, had the, no, the notion of what was happening, devolution of our environment. It was really very big on their minds back in 1984, long before everyone started running around waving their arms about global warming. And uh, they were concerned about our food being poisoned by uh, GMOs and all the stuff we sort of take for granted now. Me, being the political creature that I was, uh, became very fascinated with that. But really, if you undress the Devo album, you'll see it really is an R&B album. Uh, Mm -hmm. I used a lot of the same techniques that I used with Steve uh, on that record. Uh, You'll note, for me, reverberation, for example, connotates distance. I don't want to have a record where I'm always looking from the back of the hall down to a band on the stage with this huge amount of reverb. The more instruments and the more reverb you put on a record, the further away the band becomes. The performance gets more and more distant. For me, I want to have the very lively experience of experiencing the band close on. As a matter of fact, that's why I so love mixing superstition and surround, is that I could get the band and the instruments to occupy the same space as the listener. That is the most intimate kind of recording. So for me, I was not a big effects person, and um, I knew that the guys had their own, the Devos had their own particular sound and their own particular style, even to this day. So we got to work, we did one or two sides together, and it just really felt right. And we did uh, we did whip it and uh, yeah, talk whip about it that good. sound. Can you talk about that sound? Uh, the whip, whip it. it good was a bull whip in the hallway at the record plant. It was literally that. It was literally that nice. a bull whip in the hall. It was long, two long studios, a hallway about three and a half feet wide, between them with no roof. It was open to the sky. It was like two separate buildings, and we used to go walk down that hallway. One side was Studio A, the other side was Studio B, and the jacuzzi and the pinball room. And uh, we would be in there, and uh, we would crack that whip. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, we recorded that. We had a good time. Uh, The record was, uh, uh, it was really sort of at the edge of the technology. People thought we were a bunch of lunatics, which we were. And uh, we worked very hard. But uh, again, that record plant was, again, like Electric Lady. It was a very intimate, personal facility. It isolated the studios one from another, which are the technical aspects of it with Tom and with uh, Tom Hidley and John. But that room really sort of, uh, again, was skating on the edge of technology in terms of having the correct trapping for guitar amplifiers and 
all kinds of stuff. So but that was the lead into the today's current trends of the last 20 years of starting your own project studio in LA. Right. There's it's, thousands uh, and yeah, thousands. Yeah, everyone has their own studio now. And again, studios are musical instruments in themselves. And that's something that you need to really realize. A studio is a place where you as a human being have to live for long hours at a time. It needs to be comfortable and friendly and not you don't have to feel threatened in that space. And you have to be able to have command of your technology in there. That doesn't mean you have to have an aircraft carrier of a recording console in there. But you do have to have a space where you can have a tribal experience. And by that I mean making music with more than one person at a time. Where you can really, uh, um, you know, how, how it affects our, how it, to this day the technology really affects our lives. Your folk instrument is the laptop. My folk instrument was a clavinet. My folk instrument was a guitar. Your folk instrument is a sampler. Um, they're not better or worse, they're just different. The technology, I mean, if I pulled the plug, the school would disappear. I mean, literally. I mean, no electricity, no music. So, no computers, no music. Now, in electronic music, we've watched the trends in the last 60, 70 years of electronic music where the technology has driven the sound of electronic music. And you've obviously grown up through that. So right. tell me about your experience as the sound progressed from analog synth to digital synth to computers. Or do you, you want to talk it's about all that? A, it's the sound and the song. It's the sound and the performance. It's the execution of picture and the ex execution of audio. How you store it is not the end of the road. It shapes the technology, as I wrote here. Uh, the revolution is not just in the media business, but in a more profound way. Our entire culture has been in transition on many levels, primarily in how the role of technology continues to affect our lives socially, personally, and especially in business. Uh, how do you get a record deal today? How do you get people to listen to your music? I like to say everybody is out of the bleachers and in the field. Everybody is making music. Everybody has a record album. The album itself is the performance of your work. A lot of these albums that you folks make never see a studio at all. They exist primarily in the medium. The medium is the message. Marshall McLuhan, 1954. <laughs> there you go, yeah. It's come true. It's kind of Orwellian in a way, but uh, it's the world we live in. Uh, it's a very democratic medium because everyone has a chance. There are no more gatekeepers to say, all right, kid, I really like what you're doing. We can uh, pay all up CBS and a whole bunch of these other guys and get your record out there and we'll see that the uh, guys are taking out the Sollies for lunch and we'll play your record in the afternoon and so on and so forth as it was in the olden days with roulette records and the olden days with all of Motown and all these other guys and, you know, DJs and payola and all the scandals and all the stuff that went on. It's no different today. I mean, it's a different world, but now there are no more of those guys who are going to say, oh, I really like James Taylor, the great A&R men like James, uh, John Hammond and uh, Clive Davis and people like that who say, that's a great artist. I'm going to get behind him and spend money on that artist. No one needs to spend money on an artist now because the artist can do it without the money. The gatekeeper is not that important now. And uh, it puts everybody on the field, but then how do you define what's good and what's bad? There are no more A&R men. Mm -hmm. so people decide, like, like the song Lord that won the Grammy Award last couple weeks ago. Um, she's a New Zealand artist. Her song out for free on Spotify or on uh, not Spotify on the SoundCloud, and, um, and the world happened. found out about it and drove a path to her doorstep. She didn't have to right. send it out, and like you said, right. she didn't have a gatekeeper. The people decided that song; they liked it. It's very democratic, but it's also very noisy. Uh, but that is an interesting place to be because now you're not only dealing with music, but you're dealing with image. Uh, I mean, just think about how our music world has been uh, changed by the iPod, which was invented in 2001, by the way. Uh, 
then after that, we started having such things as uh, peer-to-peer blogs, websites, social media, MySpace, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Wikipedia, Netflix, Hulu, text messaging, viral and guerrilla marketing. And now we have all things indie, long tail, and do-it-yourself, while many of these phenomena are are still trying to figure out ways to monetize what they have. They all have in common. They're all game changers. And those are the things that you guys are dealing with now. Uh, they changed not only the way we thought about and experienced entertainment, especially music, but they changed our behavior and relationship to the content and the artists who create it. No interlocutors, no screening structure. It's democratic. It's on demand. It's on one-to-one. And that is really the reason I wrote that down is because I think it really is the nub of what's going on now. Um, Music's never going to go away. Film is never going to go away as we know film. Film is a sort of an old electrochemical word for a film, for a chemical process. It has nothing to do with films and footage. It has to do with bytes and bits and digital storage and stuff so the comes con- I mean there's no longer motion picture film in the movie house it's uh, it's sent out digitally we don't take out three thousand dollars worth of prints to a movie house once a week to change the movie they can change the movie at will so the whole structure of entertainment is changing but it's become very much more personalized in the process we've lost some things and we've gained some things um, some of the things we've gained and some of the interesting things that are coming down the pike, I think are going to be very, very major, especially for guys like you who are just getting going. And that is that we have finally gotten to a place where we can deliver online content with full bandwidth and not have to suffer through, uh, you know, eight and ten hour downloads to get somewhere to listen to something, a movie or a film or music or anything else, but that we can stream high definition, and now, finally, um, uh, we've really sort of moved from television. I mean, how many people here have cable television? One, two, I'll say a half a dozen people have cable television in this room. How many people watch network television? (laughs) That's exactly what I'm saying, because People are not going there anymore. Nobody wants to be have gatekeepers and view be home at six o'clock to watch Tom Brokaw or whoever it is that you want to watch at some appointed time. Time shifting is rampant. The whole structure of commercialization of the media has changed. And for me, if I want to watch the nightly news with Tom Brokaw at 2 a.m. in the morning, I take out my cell phone and go, NBC Nightly News. And there it is. Or I want to watch the Olympics, or I want to watch whatever I want to watch. I want to watch it on my terms. I want it to be delivered my way. And now, finally, uh, yes, uh, we're delivering this. This is my latest film-making adventure. Um, Again, shot entirely with GoPros. Uh, David Nielsen, your trusty composer in residence, wrote the music for this and has been writing seafaring music for me for years. <laughs> and uh, once again, from Canada. I'm working with another band now from Canada. I don't understand why everything... Here I am at Full Sail University. My movie's called Sail Away. I seem to be caught in this sort of sailing mode in my life. But here is a project that lives entirely on the internet, will be up in this running this year. It's two-way communications. People can send in selfies of why they want to go to sea on one of these boats, these tall ships. And we curate their videos. They do with their GoPros and their black magic cameras. And the ones we really like, we post. We have a two-way street. We can see the ones we really like. We invite those persons to voyage on the boat. When they're standing on the deck, we say, why are you here? And they say, well, this is what I was doing. And then we can cut back to that image of them in their real lives so we can see who they are and why they're sailing. This is an interesting boat. It's one of the boats we call a hippie boat because um, this is a boat that sails out of, um, out, of, uh, out of Seattle. And they take a lot of kids who have had trouble in the courts. 
and become crew on these sailboats and they changed their lives forever. I'd like to stop talking for a minute. I'll show you this. This is David's music and I'm very, very proud of it. It's going to be you get the idea. Have you ever wondered what it might be like to leave it all behind? To run away to sea for good? Or maybe just for a great adventure? Do you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself and good for the planet? Well, you can sail away, and you can be part of this story. It's good to be back, man. Yeah, it's good to have you back. How, how long has it been? Probably pushing two years. Two years, man, that's crazy. No, right? Well, you're really gonna like the captain this time. He's a tough cookie. Good. I want a tough cookie, too. All right. We have a saying, it's, uh, Ship, crew, you. That's the order of importance for any person on board. If you do those three things, then everyone is taking care of each other, including the ship. When you first show up on a boat, or you show up on a boat again after having not been there for a while, everybody on the boat is incredibly helpful. And knowing that you haven't been there for a while and helping you kind of get back into the flow of everything again. All right, so you want to lay into that line with all your weight. So basically, all the tension comes from up there instead of from here. If you look around, you see all the different lines and all the different rigging and all the different sails. And if you pull on a line when you're not supposed to, it affects what somebody else is doing. So really, it's a big team effort, and everybody's relying on somebody else to be able to pull their own weight. Yeah, a little, little nervous being back up here again after almost two years. So it's a like camaraderie there. It kind of brings people together, people from all different walks of life, too. When a crew comes together, uh, there's nothing better. These sailors are the men and women of Sail Away, a production of, by, and for the international sailing community. And these men and women are the creators, crew, and producers of Safe Harbor Pictures. Here, anyone who has the heart to venture out can embark on the voyage of a lifetime. We are creating a community here around a community that is very worthwhile, very interesting, and very beautiful. Billions of people have a story to tell. And it's not just about the ships, and it's not just about the people, it's about what the ships do to the people. It will become a globally accessible social interaction platform. Sail Away is a different kind of production, a broadcast quality real world seagoing adventure series launched on a new online multimedia portal where sailors and enthusiasts everywhere can meet to share their stories and their own videos. And it's back to the sea. It's teamwork, it's education, and it's sensitivity to the planet. We hope to improve the whole industry, the whole tall ships community by drawing in more people, by helping every single person in this ecosystem, and that's really what it is. Safe Harbor Pictures invites you, the international sailing community, to participate in making Sail Away a reality. Still making movies <laughs> from 1967 to now. Thank you. Telling stories. Yeah. You, you're saying movie making is like telling stories, so that's your idea. Is you're, you're even taking it literally, so now people are telling their own story. Is that right? Is that but this is uh, the interesting thing about this project is that it's a two way street. It's not just watching something passively and saying, oh, that's happening, and so forth. But people are asked to participate in the production in their home or wherever they are. The interesting thing that even makes this more compelling is uh, one last little bit of technology that's blowing down the pike that I think needs to be talked about is the concept of surround and earphones. Uh, this is the last step that we really need to be able to deliver content as it's intended to be delivered with no compromises, no medium of modifying the message in a sense, is that they have developed technology now, it's called Headphone X, uh, DTS, has developed it. There are others who've developed similar programs, but this one seems to be 
talk about DTS for a second? Yeah. That, that people not, might not be familiar with them. Uh, DTS, the Digital Theater Systems, uh, did the original uh, Jurassic Park in surround in 5.1. Uh, Steven Spielberg got behind the company and they, he insisted that that film be released in that format and that's how DTS got started, but they've always been known as the classic um, high-end platinum standard for audio and film. Uh, this is something that they've developed over the last couple of years. I'm totally fascinated by it. The reason being is that now, looking at my cell phone or my iPad and watching a movie, I can actually get the audio as it was intended for the theatrical release. To me, that's very important. When I'm aloft on this boat, I want to be able to uh, have that experience sonically of the guy down at the helm you know, yelling commands and watching the sails moving, hear all of that in context with the picture. Now we only be, are able at most to do it in stereo with limited bandwidth. That's, that wall is soon to disappear. And we will have full frequency, full surround on a cell phone. Hmm. And uh, I think that that is going to be the next major step forward. It will bring surround to the masses, not on your father's sound system with the subwoofer in the fireplaces. I always like, like to have your mom say, honey, get that subwoofer out of the fireplace right now, <laughs> right? Those days will be at an end because you will be able to take it and in 10 years, when you're my age sitting here on the other side of the microphone, you will be taking surround for granted just as you will be taking 3D for granted. I've seen fantastic 3D on a cell phone. So, yes, we will be, in some cases, using it to imitate reality, but I think in the long run, we're gonna to start to see all this media in a very new light. I mean, for me, I would rather be sitting inside a performance than sitting in front of it right now. They say, well, this is a performance of, and you imagine this proscenium arch, you know, uh, and uh, thanks, I'm oh, sure. that up. Sure. Uh, um, you know, and if here's the performance in front of you and it took three and a half minutes to perform. Well, all of you in this room know that a lot of pop music doesn't take three and a half minutes to perform. You're in the studio for weeks on end overdubbing and underdubbing and <laughs> flub-a-dubbing and doing whatever it is, <laughs> fixing everything you've broken because you didn't record it right in the first place. And everything you record needs to be re-equalized and read this and read that. If you hear it right the first time you record it right, leave it alone. You know, it's good when you got it in your head from the get-go. What's happening is that we are beginning to see the media converge totally. Uh, the reason I bring this up, this is a console designed by a friend of mine named Stephen Slate. You actually have one of these here at the school. It's, I believe, in your remote truck. I would recommend that you guys take a look at that because what that is really is a huge multi-channel mouse. That console is actually the back end of a Pro Tools rig. Um, the glory of it is that um, you can touch more than one control at a time. You don't have to mouse your way through music, pushing one fader up and down. You know, you can actually put your hands on the board and feel the, feel the music, experiment with it. And you're able to bring all the control surfaces to bear on it. The interesting thing about it is it's a glass console, which means you can change how the board is set up, where you want to put the equalizers, where you want to put the, the remote control machine, machine controls and everything. You can orient the console in any way you want. But the ramifications are that this can also be used with an Avid to edit movies. Instead of that being faders, there are some slides that, I don't know if you have them, where you can actually see the sound streams of the, uh, of the Pro Tools going across the screen. You can edit like this with your hands. Mm. Okay, I love that. <laughs> you like that. Um, you can actually yeah, edit with the uh, right edit <clears throat> much more visually and much more dynamically by virtue of the fact that you can see <clears throat> excuse me, what you're editing. 
he's also done some interesting emulations of yeah, he makes great uh, stuff. analog gear, which sort of Oops. helps you relate. But is, is, it a, is it an analog piece of gear? Not really. It looks like one, but it's really digital. But the ability to do that is interesting. The other interesting thing is that soon we'll be seeing Avid picture editing like this on the same surface. So conceivably, you could walk into a room and say, I have an idea for a two and a half minute film about sailing. You could have all the picture edit in front of you on the screen like that with your hands. And then with the mere flick of a switch, you can be working on the audio. So yes, that's in the beginning stages, but uh, this is a very uh, interesting uh, vision of the future. That and 7.1 earphones and things like that are things that you guys are going to be making product for. So talk about that company, Headphone X. Talk about that company a little bit. Headphone X, uh, DTS, which I described earlier, is able to now take a normal set of headphones. You can get the demo, which is on the online, DTS, Headphone X. And you can actually hear the musical placement of left, center, right, left, rear, right, rear, sides, and four elevation channels. Uh, on a set of headphones. Um, where I'm headed next week is the meeting with DTS since I've worked with them in the beginning years and years ago as their sort of ambassador without portfolio. I used to do all their demonstrations and theorizing for them for all the major trade shows back 15 or 20 years ago. And um, Sail Away, my series of running in both directions will be in 7.1. That's where that's going. So we will, you will not only experience the imagery, but you will experience the audio the way I think it should be handled in the first, first class quality. And it gives you a chance to say, oh, why the hell do I have to mix this and be fancy about it? It's going to be an MP3. It's going to sound like audio coming through a screen door. You know, it's, that's over, OK? It's quality is back to stay, and you guys got to really concentrate on doing it the right way. And that doesn't mean returning to analog. Analog's fine. It's a good way of storing information for certain things. It has a, uh, we're predisposed to its sound, much like you guys are predisposed to hearing about MP3s. A lot of people on this planet haven't heard music in any other way as in, than in, on an MP3. So why, uh, and they don't even know what really good, high-quality music is. You have the blessing of being at a school like this where you can actually, you know, take the time to experiment with this and to do some adventuresome stuff. Why don't you guys do some surround mixing, but do it from the get-go and conceive, you know, do a Beethoven string quartet with the microphone in the middle and the four instruments around you. Think about moving instruments in space because they'll never be performed live. It's not a live, an imitation of a live medium. A recording is its own performance. Every time you play that performance, it's a performance. Every time you play that song and you put earphones on, it's a performance. Just as much as I, when my time when I was a kid, playing music from the Brill Building on the you know, publishing company on Tin Pan Alley, when my father was a kid. You know. It's the same thing, but now we have a different way of expressing ourselves. And the important thing is the song, the song, the song. The content, the content, the content. The storage, it's all very well and good, very intuitive. You can learn how to push every button in the world in this place. Mm -hmm. But if you don't come into this place with some set measure of creativity and inspiration, you're not gonna get anywhere. That's what separates the wheat from the chaff. Does there anybody have any questions at all? I'm happy to answer. What would be your advice, um, since you've been in the industry so long, um, on like for women and like women that want to be engineers, but um, you probably didn't see very many women in and out of the studio working. So I was just wondering, maybe what would you be your advice? You know, it's a really good question, um, and, it re and I think it's a very important question. Uh, I think there's a lot of room for women in engineering. Um, when I first had my first woman assistant, her name was Joan DeCola, and she worked at the, she worked at Electric Lady. She was a bookkeeper, and she swore like a sailor, though I don't <laughs> tell you that much. But we had her down to work with us, and you know, it used to be a guy thing, 
you know, engineering. It was for the guys. That was sort of the male witch doctors. There were no female witch doctors. And uh, we started getting gals to work early on. Um, it has been a rarity, but I think we're seeing more and more of it. It is not an exclusive male dominated club anymore. There's some very, very fine female recording engineers. I would note, with particular note, uh, the lady who runs the sound department at Skywalker Ranch, Leanne Myers. Um, Leslie Jones also. Is uh, Leslie, Leslie Jones, Jones, I'm sorry, yeah. Something. Leslie Jones, the perfect example of somebody who's been in the career, made it a long-term career, and probably one of the best engineers post, on the planet. Post-production engineer. Yeah, so. post-engineer. There is room, especially in post-world, and in sound design, I find that there are a lot of women in that. I also see a lot of women moving into gaming and uh, into the areas where it require a lot of intricate work. Guys sometimes don't really have the patience for it. Um, but the ladies do get in there and they do work that. And I think it's a very important career path. And uh, I uh, praise you for making an effort to get into it. I think you've made a good decision. Hi, my name is Amanda, and I'm partially deaf. My question to you is, um, sometimes I encounter situations where people are like, oh, you can't hear out of one side, so how can I trust you? What are your opinions on having engineers who are... Are you hearing impaired? In one ear. Uh -huh. Well, I'm hearing impaired. Um, after 40 years at high level, uh, I don't hear the same way I used to. Uh, I use the hearing aid. Uh, their hearing aids are like glasses um, for your ears. Um, there are certain things you cannot do and there are certain things you can do. But there are places for hearing impaired people in the audio world and especially moving toward video. Uh, I like making movies because my eyes are not impaired at all. But um, uh, yes, there are, there are places for that. Yes, hearing can be corrected. You cannot really uh, validly do stereo or surround mixing because you have no perception of position without two ears. Can I add something? Brian Wilson is famously deaf in one, mostly right. deaf in one ear, and he mixed most of his records in mono, and they're still the mono mixes people like sometimes more than the stereo ones, pet sounds particularly. Right. So, so yes, there is, but you have to understand what your limitations are. Uh, I paid the price after 45 years, but uh, fortunately I'm blessed. My hearing isn't so damaged that I can't work. I am working. I'm mixing a band from Canada <laughs> <laughs> right now called Flash Bastard in Los Angeles and having a very good time doing it, too. But the thing is, right now, I always like to say adapt or die. You're in a place to really change the world, and you can change the world if you remain innovative and keep your uh, creative options open. Don't look back, say, oh, I wish, people come to me and say, oh, I wish I was born when you were, you could, when you were doing, working with Stevie and the Isley Brothers and this and that. I say, no, no, no. That was then, this is now. You have to make your own, you have to make your own gravy. And you can make gravy now. It's a different world. There's no more gatekeepers. Like I like to say, everyone's out of the bleachers and in the field. But you're in the field now. Take advantage of it. Be your own person. You can be your own artist, your own businessman. You can be your own creative person and make the world go around for you. You don't need as many people to be famous either. You can sell 10,000 records, and without all the other people with their hands in your pocket, you can do just as well as somebody who has a major record deal who's selling 150 or 200,000 records. You know, back then, a budget for a record was $250,000. That was considered a budget to make a really first-class LP. Well, today, prime super budget from Sony, $80,000. And it's not even in the same dollars. So know that, you know, the, the medium and the model has changed. You have to exist in a new world, in a new space. It can be done. You guys are here for a reason, to be able to develop your craft and your art. And that is the best way to start, is to be educated. Because once you get the knowledge in your noggin, no one can take it away from you. And that really is what's most important. Any other questions? Uh, I recall having watched that um, 
that video of uh, Tonto that was playing uh, earlier. Um, and one particular quote from Malcolm struck me uh, when he was referring to um, sound that was playing. It was just birds and like a wave. Mm -hmm. And his quote was that um, all organized sound he considers to be music. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you, how, do, how does that idea reflect in the work and in your work over the years? It reflects, strangely enough, there's a piece I'm working on now with that Canadian band that starts with rain. Again, um, I can go back to the birds with Minnie Ripperton, uh, God bless her, um, in which we, you know, Loving You, for example, which we had the recorded sound of birds. Uh, Living Just Enough for the City is another example of creating a space and an environment where we cre created a cityscape for, you know, New York, just like I remembered it. And you hear the bus pull away, which is really an oil truck at 4 o'clock in the morning on 57th Street, me <laughs> running around with a Niagara trying to, oh, could you do that again, please? <laughs> Stuff, right? Um, Whose but, voice was that doing the, the voiceover? Uh, Johan and Vigoda, Stevie's lawyer. Oh, nice. 40 years, clunk. Nice. Right? Nice. But those little sound vignettes are like making movies. It's the same thing as a movie, okay? You create this ambient space, you create a space, and the space itself tells a story. Stevie being unsighted, this was something that we really loved doing because we could create these sound environments in which he could set the song. And I think now we're beginning to see when you have your GoPro camera, you can say, oh, I'm going to set the drone up over here, do this shot, I'm going to create this kind of an effect, and actually be able to hear it, to be able to stand on the bow of a sailing ship and hear the skipper and the stern and the poop with the, at the wheel, of giving, you know, bringing the ship around and giving the command and hearing all the rigging moving. You don't have to see it as long as you can hear it. and You can paint the picture in your mind. Of it. That's what I love about radio drama. When I was a kid, you know, it was the Lone Ranger, it was the Sky King. You know, there was Tom Mix, there was the Lone Ranger, there was, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these shows that were on the radio for 15 minutes a night. I would be welded to the side of the radio to listen to them because I could paint my own picture of what it looked like. It's like reading a novel where you create these beautiful images. And now with all the equipment being so portable, you can do that too. And it's a big part of storytelling is to be able to set the scene. I'm really glad you asked that question. That really is important. It was, uh, that was really what set a lot of Stevie's stuff apart is we were able to do that kind of stuff. Especially, I think the first real meaningful one was uh, Living for the City. That soundscape was like really critical to the song. Any other questions? Hi. By the way, I'm having a ball. I'm loving this. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk to us more about synthesis. Say again? I was wondering if you could talk to us more about synthesis. About synthesis? Yes. Uh, what in particular? Um, designing your own sounds and staying away from uh, okay. presets. That's a good question. A lot of people think synthesizers are things that synthesize the sounds of real instruments. Oh, there's the uh, Bosendorfel keyboard library. Here's the London strings, you know, and there's all the guys over in London all playing A together and B and C and stuff like that. But that's not really synthesis. That's really what I would call sampling, which uh, is a, another art form in itself. It has something to do with synthesizers, but synthesizers themselves, and the first synthesizer I had, didn't have a keyboard at all. Um, it's not a keyboard instrument. A synthesizer can be played by a variety of interfaces. It can be played with a string interface. It can be played with a wind interface. It can be played with any kind of an interface that you can attach to your body in some way or blow into or hit or something. Uh, it just takes that energy and translates it into something else. A synthesizer creates events of audio that are created entirely from vibrating electrons. It has nothing whatever to do, and I'm often extremely critical of people who will like, for example, will do a string part on a keyboard, 
right? And the, the VC of more than three or four voices. Why? Because even if you look at a symphony orchestra and you figure out maybe if you have six parts to VZ in a string section, first and second violins, violas, cellos, and bass, uh, contrabass. So when somebody does this on a keyboard and makes strings, you know that the uh, interfaces have become crossed. If it's going to be imitative, then it should, the imitation should imitate the interface that's used. Uh, it doesn't, it's not really successful if you play a guitar, you know, rip, ro uh, rock guitar on a keyboard, it's not going to have the effect of somebody doing this. So the interface is also what governs the audio, the sound of the audio, how it's played, and how music is written for that particular instrument. So, you know, music, there are often successful transcriptions in classical music from one format to another because a lot of the instruments we take for granted today in classical music weren't really invented when the instrument was, the music was written for that particular instrument. I mean, I don't know how many different transcriptions of Bach we have, probably millions, but the original instruments are not anything what they sounded like during Bach's time. Or Beethoven's piano was very different than the piano of, you know, of Wagner for example. The instruments evolve and change, but synthesis takes instrument vibrating electrons out of the air, out of space, and you create a sound that only occurs in your mind. And that is the trick of being a good synthesis, is to be able to conjure those instruments in your own head to find out really how you want things to sound. It's not you taking a picture of the real world. It's you taking a picture of your inner world. That's what makes it really so interesting. A synthesizer, you can hit one note, one switch, basically. Keyboard, after all, is just a series of switches arranged in a way that we can get to with our fingers. But that one switch could trigger 29 or 30 or 100 different events inside one particular sound. So, you know, I might do this, and all of a sudden we have... Uh, you know, the sound of the birds and the ocean crashing on one note. Just do it. There it is. So, yes, uh, true synthesis is not what we know today. When I first started playing synthesizers, we had things called the Buchla console. Had no keyboards. It's not about keyboards. Listen to the uh, early radiophonic uh, labs from the BBC. You want to hear some interesting stuff. Uh, here are some of the original Luciano Burrio records. So here are some of the original stuff uh, from the electronic music of Russia during this period, too. Some very, very interesting things going on in this country, too, at Berkeley and uh, different places. But that is called electronica. And that is a very different thing than using the synthesizer, some kind of keyboard instrument in a pop band. Mm -hmm. Different animal. Answer your question? Yeah, I think we are out of, uh, out of time, unfortunately. So uh, we want to thank you all for attending today's session, and especially we want to thank Robert Markowitz for his knowledge, for valuable information.